All right. Yeah, so the job application has really a lot of uh, um, things there. I'm, you know, I was a advocate uh, applicant before. I did interviews in companies. And now I, I see a lot of our students graduate. They went through all the job applications and uh, recently also started to hire again. Uh, so uh, definitely I, I would love to share a lot of this uh, uh, kind of uh, stories from, from insiders, okay? So we'll talk about different topics in the future. Now back to this topic, um, I started to talk about this one in fall 2014, about six years ago. And at that time I asked students, how many of you have, have used Git? Probably one fourth of the class raised a hand, uh, which was very impressive. And today I ask you how many of you have done Git? Probably I would say 80%, 90% probably already are doing that. So I don't need to spend too much time um, talking about this one. However, there are still some of you who have not used Git before, or you don't even know what Git is, or you don't even know what version control is. And then you really need to pay attention to this one. And then after the class, try to use Git and start to use that heavily, all right? And this is a very fundamental skill for you to work on software, all right? And um, all right, so let's actually look at the version control, okay? So why do we uh, ever need version control? What is version control? Uh, pretty easy to understand. You're trying to control and manage all the versions of your software, right? Think about different reasons, all right? Um, initially, uh, I, I'm sure a lot of you had this kind of experience. We want to uh, just have some kind of backup for your um, you know, uh, software. Let's say that you wrote some software, your some code um, in Eclipse or IntelliJ, right? And may, a lot of you had some kind of experience that you work on a very complicated course project that takes many days to finish. Eventually you fix all the bugs, you got a really nice version, you feel you've done a lot of work and then you don't want to lose your work, right? One thing we can do is to um, um, open the folder with the file and I will just make a zip file and to save all the version I have so far because I know this is a working version. And after that, I will probably also email that zip file to myself because I know in the email, it, it will be kept, kept in the email server, not my disk. So one day if my uh, computer died and, and I, I will lose all my files, right? So I don't know how many of you have done this, but when I, when I was in college, I often do this kind of thing to manually back up the things with the files and then send it to myself, all right? And of course, today we'll use Google Drive or some other, you know, cloud drive. And, but that's why we're trying to, you know, uh, what's the motivation about using some of the version control tools because we want kind of a backup. Something happened, I can still roll back. Um, and also, there, every software has versions, even though your software are all correct, but for some reason you do want to change different versions. Maybe the computer, the OS is too old and you cannot support the newer version. I have to switch that for some other purposes. And in software development world, you often need to rely on the dependencies. Sometimes the version doesn't matter. Sometimes the version matters a lot. So you need to specify the version. You need to change the version. So we need to have two to help us manage a different version. Another one is about the collaboration, all right? So um, when you work with a software team, all right, and um, you're not just yourself writing a code, multiple developers work on the same code base together, and that's gonna cause a lot of collaboration issues. All right, so let's take a look at some of these scenarios. All right, so this one here is pretty much explained um, how the version kernel works, why do we need that? So let's assume that there are two developers, Bob and Natalie. They're both working on this software repository, the code base here, all right? And then, um, so let's say this is a centralized copy of the code base. And then both of them start to work on this in parallel because they're the same team. So they both read and get a copy of the software. And then, and then they start to make some changes. Bob make one change, one feature, and then as makes different feature. After that, Bob pushes his code back to the repository to update the copy because he finished his feature. And then so that time the, the repository has a different version, updated version, which is the same as Bob's. And then eventually Alice also pushed her changes back to the repository. At that time, this repository has another updated version. All right, so 
did you guys see the problem here? If you do this kind of a, a way to kind of a update your repository and copy, right? So yeah, I'm not gonna ask, but obviously uh, this one here, you update the repository, but Alice just simply overwrite this copy, which will totally overwrite Bob's change. All right, because this one happens after Bob. All right, so that's a very um, bad problem you wanna see. All right, so you um, work with the team, but then when people are pushing and getting the code back, uh, they are overriding each other change. That's actually very, very bad. So when you think about how do we avoid this problem, right? So a lot of the solutions are based on this kind of mechanism using some kind of a law. So for those of you who have done the operating system course, probably you have understand or learned this concept about logging, right? So anytime when you have a, a resource that had to be shared or cannot be shared by multiple parties, then we can always set kind of a lock. So whoever has a lock or has a token can access it. Otherwise, people have to wait for the lock. All right, so that's a very typical mechanism. So you can do this kind of locking. All right, so I have a repository here and Bob has tried to work on it and Bob get the lock first so he can actually read the copy. And But Alice can't do this because Bob has a lock. The repository has been locked. Nobody else can touch it. All right, at that time, and then Bob can be free to read and write everything and, and update the repository eventually. And after that, Alice can grab the log after Bob releases the log and then get the uh, update the copy, right? So in this scenario, we do not have this kind of override problem because you know the moment you are getting a log, you get the most updated copy. All right, and then you just make your change on top of it and it remains everyone else change had happened before, all right? So my question here is, is this an ideal uh, situation? Exactly, just like Darren mentioned, uh, you know, using the lock is super safe, but you know, it's not very efficient. You know, everybody at one point, every team, only one developer can read and work on the code. That's not gonna work at all. Right. So if you only have two or three members, that's okay because you're all busy and then nobody are working on this at the same time. That's pretty realistic. But when you have a large team, then it's going to be a problem. Um, speaking of a large team, can anyone get, guess? Um, I'll give you an example of a large team. Okay. Windows team in Microsoft. They're all based in Seattle in the headquarter. Does anyone know how many people are working on a Windows um, for, the, for the whole like Windows product? Windows team guys, give me a guess. How many developers are working in a Windows team in Microsoft? 20 thousand, three. Oh, good, Jason. Yeah, it is 5,000. Yeah, 5,000 is the number I heard about five years ago. I, I don't expect to be big changes because Windows is not going to be the major only product uh, Microsoft are doing. Microsoft actually is doing pretty good recently on, the, on their uh, cloud computing, the Azure platform. So that's definitely their major focus. Windows software is important, but I don't expect the Windows team to be expanded that quickly. So about 5,000 people are in Windows team. Uh, I also know the Windows kernel team, uh, the, the most important, I won't say the most important, but the kind of a kernel that's in the um, uh, lowest level of the OS. That team has about 30 to 40 people just writing all the C and assembly code to do the kernel, um, all those uh, low level stuff, all right? But think about when you have a team of 5,000 developers, this approach is not gonna work, okay? So uh, the, the modern approach is something called a copy, modify, and merge solution. All right, so let me go through this very quickly. So we should not prevent people from loading the code, right? Even though there is a chance that they can override it, but they can at least get the copy and then start work on it in parallel because there's no point to, um, to have people to wait on, on, on reading it, right? So they both get the copy 
and then they they uh, start to make all the changes. Sorry, I think there's a, this is, this image is wrong. This should be the second one. All right, but anyway, this time uh, Alice finished her change first, so she will actually write it back. Uh, but using this approach, every time we will write the change to the back, we want you to compare your copy with the actual repository copy to make sure your version is based on the, the current repository version. So they have some kind of version number. The moment you, you, you check out your copy, you know the version you, you, you check it out. And then the moment you write it back, we want to see, okay, are your changes based on exactly the same version number? If that's true, then you can write it back because that means nothing happens after that. So you're free to check it back. Sorry, push it back. So I finished hers, so she wrote it back. And then Bob at this time also finished his. He is trying to write things back, but the, the report rejected because when they compare the version, they find out that Bob's version is actually older because there's already an update that you don't have. All right, so you cannot write this back because that will overwrite other change. So what happened here is Bob need to reload the current code back to his repository, get the latest version, and that time he will need to do some kind of merging. Okay, the merging could be pretty simple, straightforward because the changes are not happening in the same file, or it could be a little bit tricky that you need to solve some of the conflicts. All right. After that, Bob got another version, updated the version based on the new code base. At that time, when he tried to write the things back to the repository, that's allowed because that version is consistent and then no other change happened during that time. And after that, Alice can also resync the repository, get another updated version. All right. So that's basically how most version control tool today works. Not, not, not only Git, but also a lot of other tools. I'm not sure if you use other version control tools, but Git no, right now definitely is the most popular. But uh, in the old days, there are so many other choices. But the, the theory here, almost the same. All right. So that's a recommended approach. And um, other good things about tracking using the version control you know, it allows you to highlight the changes easily so you can see what people have done to change the code. Uh, some of the tools like GitHub, it also allows you to uh, figure out some of the, uh, your contributions, your, your community history, all right? So in our GitHub repository, you can also very easily find out the number of contributions, the number of changes you are committing to the repository. Okay, pay attention to that number. Uh, I, I, that, I don't mean that number means everything, but that's definitely something we will look into at the end to determine your contribution because it's very easy. Because if all your teammates made 20, 30 commits, you only made one or two, I think there will be some kind of problem. I doubt you will uh, say that you, you actually help to a lot with your, with your team. All right. And also guys, do not at the end, okay, never ever tell anyone, not just me or other instructors that, oh, you know, my, my, I, my computer is broken or somehow I used my teammate's account, I, I check into my code then, so that's not my, even though it shows up to a different account, but that's actually my commit. Never see that kind of SQLs, okay? Um, nobody's trying to verify it's true or not, but you know, it just means that most of the case you, you didn't do it or, even you did it that you're you're too irresponsible you are changing um, whatever you're doing you're not following the right rule okay so so that's some kind of attitude you know nobody like to hear about all right so just don't bother to to think you can think about some other attitude but that's a very bad idea to say oh you know i check in but it's actually under my my teammates name for whatever reason okay it, it's just very very bad bad uh, attitude to say all right um so uh, speaking of version control right now, Git is the most popular tool. Okay, why this one is popular? Um, because it performs really well. And also, it's really popular. All right, so when I was in the Amazon uh, back in 2011, uh, when I was uh, doing the internship, Amazon was using a version control tool, a version control tool called Perforce. Uh, you can still uh, uh, search and find it. It's a commercial tool called a P4. And Microsoft was using something called Code Depot. Uh, it's a tool developed by Microsoft itself. It's not really released to, to the public. And then different companies often use different tools. There's SVN. Some of you probably have heard about that. There's the CVS uh, in, uh, embedded in Windows. 
that was also very popular. However, after Git shows up, and pretty much everybody uh, start to use um, start to use uh, Git. Okay, I don't know the exact company, even the big companies, they also start to use Git. All right, so it's a it's a big trend, a very very popular tool, and simply because it's really performed really good, and then the tool is very easy to use, and also uh, I would I would say that GitHub also did a good push to make this tool even more popular. Our GitHub just built this kind of social coding called hosting for all the repositories. It's a, such a successful startup. Okay, the company was acquired by Microsoft for how many, like four billion dollars or something like that last year. All right, so very successful startup. All right, a little bit history about Git. You know, uh, it all came from this Linux. Right? You, know, you all know that Linux is a open source software and everyone can get a copy and can make some changes. You can make your own distribution of Linux. In the early days, Linux used this tool called a Bit Tracker Keeper, okay, for the version control. This is a commercial tool. And I forgot the detailed story. I, I remember something about the license that um, the Linux team cannot use this tool anymore. Something about that. I don't know why. I don't know why, because they, they stopped supporting it or they don't give free license or whatever. Uh, they can't use this one anymore. All right, so the author of Linux decided though, I will just write my own tool. All right, I'm not gonna use yours. All right, so this guy just basically created Git and he just did it by, by himself. Um, and then that turned out to be a really uh, popular and um, famous tool. So he only wrote this two software in his life and the both are super, super uh, like uh, significant all right, in terms of um, the impact. All right, so that's a little bit history uh, about Git. So Git is a very new tool. It only came out in 2006, I think, but it just grows so much popular. And because if you look at a version control tool, there are so many choices before that. And then none of the choices, you know, dominant in the market, but right now it's all about Git. All right. And when you are using Git, I'm not sure how many of you are using the graphical UI, uh, I highly recommend you start to use the command line. All right, just because um, a lot of the, hard, the the graphical UI is not really easy to use sometimes. It is very error prone. And if you want to do something very complicated, uh, there are a lot of potential that you can get errors and it's very easy to debug, and uh, not very easy to debug. But also in the professional world, when you have all the servers and you run things on servers, you don't have the UI to use. All right, so you have to rely on the uh, command line. Um, but also you should know a very big benefit of using the command line is you can integrate those command line to some of the scripts. All right, so this happens more when you do a lot of software operations, the server operations, the maintenance, that you need to have certain kind of script to um, uh, do certain tasks to automatically deploy the software, automatically clean up the logs, all of those. And um, then the command line will be the only way to go because you won't have those kind of UI to help you, all right? And um, yeah, so after that, and you know, yeah, as I mentioned, sometimes you just don't have the graphical client available, all right? So as a CS meter, you should actually start to use the command line tools, all right? So for the Git um, exercises, all right, so I, I don't wanna show too many, uh, it's really simple. Uh, I'm sure some of you haven't really done this much, but, um, uh, my recommendation is after the class, take a look at some of the tutorials about Git and you can find a lot of good resources, all right? So I'll go through some of the very basic uh, concept here, all right? So number one, you need to understand the repository, okay? The repository I already showed you in the Bob and Alex, uh, Alex example. It's basically the centralized code copy. Now, the, the way Git works is that um, every time when you are working on making some changes, you need to first get a complete copy of this repo, remote repository. All right, this is different from some other tools. The copy you get on your local computer is exactly 100% the same as the remote copy. All right, it's not a partial copy. Some older tools that they only partial copy, but Git just allows you to, uh, not allow you, but just require you to get a full copy so that you can get every information, you can just do it totally independently on your local uh, environment. 
That's how they do it. So the very first step you need to do is always to clone the repository from the existing uh, repository, right? So let's actually try to show uh, some examples. All right, so I'm gonna go to GitHub. All right, so let me actually create um, a demo repository. So let me create a new one. All right, so I'll, I'll do something called uh, CS4800, get and fall 2020. All right, public, I'll add a readme file, create a repository. All right, so um, if you use GitHub or some other tools, you can just create your centralized copy right here as your host. Obviously, you can also host your own uh, GitHub server but uh, you don't need to do that. GitHub just does everything for you already. All right, so this is your centralized copy. Now, if I want to make some changes, I just need to get this copy to my local computer and then work from there. And then to do that, you will need this command called um, git clone, right? So I'm going to open my terminal here, All right? So I will go to my workspace final folder. I have a 4800. All right, so there is one um, uh, project, that's the web service project. All right, so I'm doing a command called a git clone, and I need to specify which repository I'm gonna clone. So you click on this button here, you get this address, and then you copy it over. All right, that's the address server uh, to your repository. I hit enter, and you can see it just quickly download everything, not many files, and I do the file folder again. I can find out this little uh, folder here. So I get into the folder and there is this one file called readme file. And if you wanna see what's inside readme file, is this just one line of code, uh, uh, the title, which is the same as the one you see right here. All right, but by doing this one, I'm actually getting a local copy of the repository from GitHub, which is the host. All right, and this copy is exactly the same as the remote copy right here. So that's how you actually start to work with Git. Just get a local copy first. And all the changes you're doing, you go to the local copy first. All right. So after that, then you need to know how do I make some changes? How, how can I make some uh, push my changes to the remote repository, right? So you do a few command called add, commit, and push. This represents different kind of steps. All right. So let me show you this. Um, so once you get here, all right, so uh, before I show you the adding, you need to know some of the very important command. One is called a git status, right? So the git status is your friend, okay? So it's really helpful. Anytime when you are in a git repository, you always use git status to try to understand what's going on right now in the repository. Where are we and what's the status? What are the things I need to do? Are there any issues? So right now, this one just shows you, okay, you are on the branch master and it's all up to date and nothing to commit, working tree coin. So looks like it's a very good status, all right? And then, so let's make some changes, all right? So there is a readme file. I'm gonna make some changes just on the readme file. Open my, uh, just, uh, I'm gonna use VM to do some changes. All right, <clears throat> so uh, I'm doing something like, uh, uh, you know, section, uh, Copy one, get, copy two, and y, get, come on. All right, so I make some changes, and then I'm going to save my, my change right here. And right now, if you look at my file, I have some extra content, All right? But this content only sits in my local copy. If I go back to here, I refresh, and this one doesn't change, All right? So what I want to do is I want to push my chain from my local to the remote repository. All right, so there's a few steps. Number one, let's try to, to get status. Now, as you can see, it says that change is not staged for commit. And then there is one file here that says modified. All right, so that's why you need to understand some of this kind of a, um, uh, different little stages, all right, when you are working on some changes. So we're right now at this working directory, we're making changes. 
and then you can do any kind of change you want. It has nothing to do with the remote repository. But the moment if you decide you want to push things to the remote repository, you have to go through the two extra steps. One is you have to confirm what are the changes that you want to uh, add to the next version. We call it putting that into a staging area. Once you have a bunch of uh, changes in this area, you're, you're, you're good to go. Then you create a one commit to include all those changes. And then finally, you push that one to the remote repository. All right. So the reason to have this one is to, this step is for, for you to identify what are the changes I want to push and what are the changes I do not want to push. Because there might be some kind of testing you do in the folder here that has nothing to do with the final change that you don't have to have the, uh, the repository to manage that. You don't want to have the Git remodeler to monitor that. So at that time, you don't have to do the uh, staging. So oh, let's come back here. Let me show you this again, Git status. This is the file being modified. And I think this is the change I want to push eventually. So I do git add, and I do this file name. I want to add this one to the staging area. All right, so now I do git status. As you can see, it says changes to be committed. So this means I already confirmed that this file will be uh, show up in my next change or next uh, push. All right, so I already kind of added here, so it's green. And then you might have a lot of files in this kind of a stage because one feature change is just it's not often, not just one file I have model files. So at that time you can say, okay, I will, I will do some other changes, but eventually I'm done with my change. I want to push, I want to uh, send it to the remote. This time you need to do something called a git commit. All right, so you commit one change to the remote server. Once you hit this command, it automatically opens the code editor from your OS. If it's Windows, it probably open the notepad. So this one asks you to, to type some kind of commit message. This is very important. So you want to show and type what you're changing and what's the purpose of the change. So I'm going to type something called, this is the first push I make. Yeah, 4800, get them. All right, just to describe briefly what you're changing and what's the purpose of change. So save this one, and then you're done with this commit. Now I do get status. All right, so you just finished kind of a local change, and that's called one commit. And then they said that your branch is ahead of original master by one commit. So that means right now, this copy I have in my local computer is ahead of this one here because this one still doesn't have this uh, change I made recently. But then the local copy knows it because I made a bunch of changes, I made a commit, and now I'm adding things on top of it. And it has more things than the remote server. But again, this is still only sits in the local. And that's why it's actually here called a local repository. I made the changes to the local repository, not here. And if I want to do one more thing, I'll just do something called a git push. All right, this time as you can take a little bit longer because we're uploading the file to the server. After that, we do git status and it come back to the clean up to date version. And now if I go back to the, to the browser, I refresh. All right, so as you can see, we are adding these two things into the streaming file. All right, so that's how you completely pushing one change from local to remote repository. All right, so it's pretty much this four command at commit push, All right? Just this once. Let me see if there are any kind of questions here. Oh yeah, for license, um, it's, it's all up to your choice, right? Because uh, if you want to open source it and um, you, can, you can pick a, a the difference between different lessons is uh, how you how much like uh, uh, rights you gave to other developers if they reuse your code. Can they commercialize that? Can they actually um, uh, publish that or whatever? So there are different licenses that give you kind of some. Some of those are very like free. Some of those are very restricted. So 
it's your choice. You can take a look at the differences between the, the license, right? Um, let me see some other question here. <clears throat> what we, we have two folders, one server and the other client that have had a lot of trouble combining this. So are you talking about um, like a initialize an existing folder into GitHub? Yeah, right. So I, ha I have some good practice with that one. So the way I showed you Git clone is something you already create from here. That's all we'd recommend it. Uh, but also a very common case is this. All right, so let's say I go to Eclipse. I, I have one project there, all right. All right, so let me see. So let's say I create a new project. It's a Java project. All right, and then I can create a new class. All right, so I did something. But initially, I didn't really do anything on the repositories. Uh, I didn't do that version control. And now I decided oh, this project, I want to save it, right? But it's not really a Git project. So, uh, th so this means that you want to create this local copy and then make it at a remote uh, repository somewhere in GitHub, for example, All right? To do this, again, the, the same thing. The best way to do this is you go to GitHub to create one repository, uh, repository first. So I create one called CS4800. All right, I'll do a git demo job. All right, make it public. All right, so again, this part is very important. If you have this kind of situation, the best way to do this is don't initialize any of those. Because the, the, the moment you create a file there, that means this repository already have something. But then if you don't create it, then this repository has nothing there. When this one has nothing, it's a little bit easier for you to adapt some of the changes to this one here. And then I really want you to pay attention to this command. These are basically the things you will need. How could you get a local uh, folder from your local computer and then push it to here? And then keep in mind this command. This one shows you all the things you need. All right, so let's try this. So I'm going to find out, I need to find out this one first of where this, uh, uh, this one here is. Okay, folder. Right here. This is the folder we just created, the project. If you do a git status, as you can see, it's not a git repository. So it's not git yet, All right? So let's follow the steps here. Okay, first one is called a git initialize. So this way it will make this repository as a git repository. So now if you do git status, all right, so everything is fine. But then you're not really committing anything. There are some files here, and then, but then you didn't check in any of those, right? And then you choose what to add. All right, so I'm gonna get add, for example, the source folder. That is, for example, I wanna get add, uh, maybe something else like project setting. That is, always do the status. I want to add maybe, some other settings, this one shouldn't be needed. So I'll do a settings. All right, but I don't want to check in a bin folder or other folder. All right, so I confirm all the changes and then do a commit. So git commit. All right, so now git status. I got one commit here. Uh, wait, sorry, did I do it correctly? All right, so this file is not tracked, but I have something to, to commit, right? So let me, let me just keep going. And then you also need to create a branch uh, called master. And let's just follow this command here. And then 
this is very important. This is how you can add the remote repository to this local. Because right now, your local repository is not associated with the remote repository. So you need to add this one by adding the address. And now they're together. And finally, you do you, you this kind of gish command, uh, git push command to, to push that to the origin master. Okay, so you use this one here to try. That's how you can get your things out there. All right, so now if you refresh the repository, and then you got the changes right here. All right, so um, this is the easiest way I, I can tell you that's easy to follow. Uh, you saw this list of commands from GitHub if you follow that steps, all right? Um, however, if you do have something existing that you want to adapt to here, it's still possible. Um, all you need to do is Google and find it. But you know that's normally what I do. It's a very reliable way to follow that list of command to go. Uh, you won't get it wrong. And another trick I, I want to tell everyone is for Git. Sometimes you will mess up your Git repository. Okay, somehow you could get status so things are totally out of control. Uh, don't be panic. Normally, what you need to do is back up your file first. Another way you can do is if you look at the folder here, if you show all the hidden folder, if this is a Git repository, there will be some folder called .git. All right, so if you go to .git, this one has everything about this repository, and then you don't have to touch these files. It's managed by Git to itself. All right, every single history is managed and saved into this .git folder. So if you find this whole repository is totally messed up, all you need to do is to remove that folder. So remove folder. All right, that's it. After that, you look at all the Git stuff. It's not a repository anymore. You're not losing anything. Um, and, and everything is, is saved here. So this is a really nice feature about Git because in the past, the version control tool will put a lot of things into different folders and for various purposes. But now Git has everything in one folder. Now you, you clear it, it's gone. And this is no, no longer a Git repository. Then you can reset everything, redo everything. So it gives you opportunity to redo it, All right? So that's, um, that's something I want to mention here. All right, so that's how you add and also talk about some of this um, uh, command that how do you do the status, how do you show the log uh, and, and branch. The log means that, you know, if you go to here and you get log, oh, sorry, this is not a git repository. Let me come back to the 40 class. I do git log. All right, so you can see it shows the list of commit I made recently uh, with all the community messages. And you can also see the same thing here um, in uh, Git repository. If you can also see here that that's how when you make a change and what the change you make and then you can click on the change, you can see, oh, okay. So these are the things we just added to the repository. So very clear. All right, so these are the command you need to know. All right. And finally, uh, there is a kind of a synchronized command I need to show everyone. So that you probably know it, right? So here is one situation, the Bob Alice situation. So let me come back to maybe, again, I'll use a very simple example here. I'm gonna open the two terminals here to show you, to, just to, so that you, you can assume these are like, uh, uh, these are two different repositories. Okay, so I'm gonna go to a temporary folder. I'll go to a different folder here, okay? And make a repository workspace. All right, so these are the same computer, but assume these are two computers, okay? Two different users. This one has the repository here. This one also has it here. So I'm gonna do a git clone. I'm gonna clone this one, uh, this repository again. Right. So this one here and this one here, just like Bob Alex example, they have the same copy. All right. This is the copy and this is copy. Order here. So this is also another copy. All right. So they're exactly the same thing, but the two different user. All right. So we're going to push things one by one, right? So for example, I push something here. Called um, uh, you know, uh, 
I'll do maybe I'll do another file. Okay, I'll do a uh, I'll do a readme a readme two txt from Bob. Do a git status. So I'm gonna do the add very quick. Okay, I'll just add this one here and do a commit message. Bob's Bob change. I can get a push. All right, so now this one here, you push the new version and then you go to here, you refresh the repository, now there are two files, All right? But then this one here doesn't have that change, right? So this one still only has one file, but that's okay. I can also create my own. I do readme, uh, I'll do readme three, txt from, from Alice. And then I just create another file. I do git add remix three. I do git commit from Alice. All right, so let's see this one. I'm gonna do a git push. All right, so suddenly uh, I saw this message. It said rejected. All right, and basically look look at the message. They said that updates were rejected because remote contains work that you do not have locally. This is usually caused by another repository pushing to the same reference. So you want to first integrate those and do all this command. So that's basically the scenario we explained that your version is based on the older version because the bot just pushed something, all right? So all we need to do right now is to synchronize the change. All right, so I'm going to do a git pull. That's the typical command. I also recommend you do git pull dash dash rebase. All right, so I, this is a highly recommend command. You can Google the difference uh, but I'm just listing all this command I normally use right here to to um, uh, re rebase your repository so that you don't have to create the extra uh, push to get. Okay, you can look at the documentation, but it's it's very easy and uh, very difficult to understand exactly what's going on. But I'm just telling you this is probably the preferred best practice for most of cases. All right, so that's the one I normally use. Uh, but then let me run this one. You can see the results. So if you do this. All right, so it's, it's actually automatically update the change repository and try to merge the change if possible. And now if I list the file, as you can see, it has all the three files. Okay, one, two, three, all have it. And then if you do get status, and then you still have one commit you haven't pushed. This time if I do get push, and then you can push it because now your version is synchronized. So I go back to refresh, and then we got all the changes. And if I come back here, this one only has two files. If I do get pool dash dash rebase. All right, so now it change, get all the changes. So now both version has exactly the same uh, changes. Sorry, same same version. All right. So that's what you need to do when you try to synchronize all the change. All right. Um, but one more thing I, I missed, I didn't talk, which I should, is I'll take you one more minute. All right. What if two people are, are changing the same thing? Okay, that's something you should be careful. All right, so if I'm Bob, I'm changing this file here. And then I'm Alice. I also need to do the same. All right, so I might, for example, I'm adding like topic one, I'm gonna change it to why get for version control. This one here, somehow I also feel this is something wrong. Instead of saying topic one, I say top, so, uh, topic colon, colon, all right? So Alice finish hers first. Get add, get commit. Get push. All right, no problem because as push it first, so you, you change this one first, all right? And then when Bob finishes his change, he save the change, you do get add, get commit. All right, and then when you do get push, all right, something gonna change, you have to redo it, re-synchronize, so get pull dash dash rebase. All right, 
And this time it says that, you know, I'm actually trying to uh, get updates and I'm trying to merge everything, but the inventory said fail to merge the change. All right, and then you have to re manually resolve all the conflicts and mark them, resolve all of those, and then look at all the command. So this time what happened is, even though you're trying to um, synchronize the code, but this time we found that these two developers make the same change to the same file at the same position. So Git doesn't know which one to pick. So that's why Git has to leave that job for you to decide. So if I open this file here, readme, as you can see, the file has been changed like this. It said that, you know, right now the head of the repository in the remote looks like this. That's exactly what Alice changed. And then this is a version that you have on your current local copy. Which of this one do you want to use? Again, because the Git doesn't know who's right or who's wrong, and this one had to be done manually. So this is called resolving the conflicts. So I have to manually decide, oh, you know what? I think Alice change makes sense. So I'm gonna use hers, but at the same time, I'm gonna add my change on top of it. And also there's a typo, so I need to fix that one. And that's it. So the rest, I don't need it anymore, so I'll just delete it. This is called a manually resolving the conflicts. Once you're done, oh, by the way, I need to save also this one here. Once you're done, save the change. All right, get status. All right, so you need to follow this command here to, to finish this one. So git add Why does my setup become so slow? All right, and then get rebase dash dash continue. All right, and then we do get push. And now you're, you're finished re resolving the conflicts, you push everything to the repository. So now I go back here. All right, so that's the latest version. Okay, so because of the time, um, I don't have too many time to spend uh, to talk about this one. But this part is one piece that you might face uh, occasionally, all right? So when multiple people are changing the same place of the same file, you will probably need to resolve the conflicts. Resolving the conflicts is, is really nothing challenging. You just need to be careful and then look at all the changes and decide how you want to clean up and then merge them together. Most of the time, Git can help to, to, to merge it for you, but um, some cases you have to do something by yourself. All right. So that's just a very quick go through of the basic Git stuff. All right. So uh, get a very practical tool. You just need to do all this command more and you will understand more. Nothing to memorize. You just need to know how do you clone and push changes and synchronize the change. That's pretty much the only thing you do with Git. All right. So I will post another assignment okay, for Git that um, make sure everyone have your repository ready. You need to check your code change. Also, I'm gonna send you another uh, website to change. So we actually have this set for a project website. Uh, let's see. All right, so we have this one here for everyone to put your code there. I will actually send a uh, assignment description. So that will be our next um, assignment or about using Git. Okay, so that's all I want to share today. And um, I'll stay here for another 20 minutes. Let me know if you have any questions.